It had been almost three weeks since Giovanni had actually tried to sleep, and it had been three days since Mira had returned home. Though Giovanni was tired, he was more afraid to sleep. He wanted to close his eyes and think of Mira, but he knew that wasn't very likely. His dreams were never very happy or sweet. Giovanni assumed that it was yet another part of his cursed existence. With Mira gone from his sight, Giovanni was haunted. In every room of the house, he could still smell the lingering aroma of her scent. His only escape was behind the locked door of his secret room, but even that escape was little comfort to him at the time. He lay there in bed, staring at the alarm clock Mira had left behind. He missed her so much, and he didn't even know why. He brought the clock into his room to add some temporary illumination and to keep him from company in Mira's absence. He convinced himself that she'd, been, that she'd have to come back eventually, even if it was only to get her alarm clock. Deep down, he knew that this whole notion was silly, but he just wanted to keep himself hopeful. Giovanni had never had any kind of nightlight before, even as a child. The plain fact of the matter is that if you, you can see in the dark, you really don't need a nightlight. After staring at the glowing numbers of Mira's alarm clock for about an hour, Giovanni finally began to drift off into a deep sleep. Giovanni opened his eyes to a familiar place, but he wasn't sure where or when it was. He didn't know why or how he'd gotten there, but he knew he'd flown. He found himself perching down on a tree limb. It was in the middle of the day and the sunlight wasn't hurting his skin. He somehow felt different on the inside, almost as if he was com a completely different person, free from the turmoil of that other existence. Giovanni looked down at his body with amazement. It was glowing like sunlight reflecting off a brown statue. He looked down and around his arms and legs and saw that they were golden. He turned to see his back and he saw that she, he'd sprouted the wings of an angel. Looking down at his hands and feet, he saw that all of his black crystal-like nails were gone. In their place were pristine white pearls instead. He, for once, saw himself as something pure, something virtuous and not monstrous at all. Giovanni felt as if he was watching himself from the inside and out, all at once. He, never, he had never been more, more aware of himself or so delighted. He looked down toward the ground and saw an attractive young woman carrying a large pail into a barn. Her skin was freckled and pale, and she had rosy cheeks. Her hair was long and straight, and it was black like the night. She seemed so familiar to him that he didn't know her. Giovanni watched as the young man filled feeding troughs with water to be cleaned, as she reached for a scrubbing brush, Giovanni could see that someone or something was following her. He sensed that trouble was on the way. He tried to call out to her, but she could not hear him. His voice made no sound. Giovanni left the tree and swooped down to the ground to achieve a closer look. There he saw a creeping perpetrator bouncing from beam to beam in the rafters of the barn. Drool slipped from the monster's mouth while it hovered over the unknowing young woman. Giovanni tried to fly up to see his fiendish stalker, but he couldn't lift his feet off the ground and his wings would not flap. Giovanni knew something bad would happen if he could feel it in his heart, but it seemed he could do nothing to stop it. He did not understand. Why was this happening? How could he appear to be so powerful, be so angelic, and not be able to help someone in need? Giovanni refused to give up his pursuit. He pushed his body forward and moved from door to door and window to window, trying to get into warn, trying to get in to, to warn and protect the young woman. Looking through a window, Giovanni finally saw the villain's full horror. He established a clear vision of the attacker as it leapt down from the ceiling toward the woman. It was the most hideous monster he'd ever seen, much worse than his own reflection. A twisted and mangled troll with charcoal for skin on a hairless body stalked about. He had empty holes carved out of its skull where, where, once, where eyes once were. There were two large dull spikes protruding from its hunched back where it looked as though wings had been violently ripped from its body. Its hands were made of jagged bones held together with rotting ligaments, and its feet crackled as if moved along the floor. In the troll's hands were two long golden rods that whipped back and forth, almost like lassos. Each rod was attached to the end of a large iron spike that punched through the shoulders of a young man's dying body. The rods held up the young man's body as though he were a puppet being pulled by strings. To the young woman, however, the troll simply appeared as a shadowy figure lingering around the painfully disturbed and ailing young man to moving toward her. The troll maneuvered the young man's body around the girl for attack, delivering blow after blow. The monster had taken over this young man's body. It was using him as a weapon to attack this poor girl for what seemed to be the sheer enjoyment of it. It laughed a loud cackle as it threw the girl down to the ground, tearing her raggedy dress. Giovanni could see the girl's anguish and could hear her screams. Throbbing and pathetic pain consumed him in every place the girl was struck, but Giovanni could do nothing to stop it. Giovanni began to cry, weeping and sobbing. He tried to look away, and he tried to get away, but he couldn't. 
That's when it began to happen. He became consumed with anger and hatred. Giovanni's body grew hot and began to sizzle. Smoke and steam began to rise up from his body as his wondrous glow began to fade, and he became shrouded in darkness. Everything around him began to catch fire as he began morphing into anger. The smell of burning wood and flesh assaulted his tortured senses, and Giovanni knew he was changing.